Hey guys, I am Kat Kalamia. I am the co-creator and writer of Slice of Life, the webtoon. My folly daughter, they call her Dancer, and also the editor and creator of Five Visibility, a bisexual anthology. Follow me on Twitter at Comic Uno, and this is Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We're joined today by a very talented comic creator. She is, of course, uh, known for her work for her webtoons, Slice of Life, uh, and a bunch of others that I will let her describe because I would do it injustice myself, personally. But we're joined today by the talented Kat Calamia. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. Thank you for having me. Oh, nice having you on the show. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, and we will dive into your creativity as well as, as a writer, but tell us who you are and what you've created recently. Yeah, so I am Kat Kalamia. I am the co-creator and writer of Webtoon Slice of Life. We just had a Kickstarter that ended. We had over 500 over 500 backers. Uh, so that was a pretty solid campaign for us. The webtoon has over 30,000 subscribers. We have even been up for a full year. Found an anime character that comes to life and falls in love with a high school cheerleader. So that's kind of the main project we're working on right now. We do actually have another Kickstarter launching on Monday, but we're keeping it a surprise. That's what we decided. Uh, so we're experimenting and we're actually keeping this one as a surprise. So we're excited to launch that on Monday. Um, and yeah, I'm also the editor and creator of Bi Visibility, a bisexual anthology uh, this summer. We have volume two coming out for that on Kickstarter. And also the creator of Like Follow Like Daughter and They Call Her Dancer. So uh, we have issues coming out for that as well. Issue three for The Dancer and Like Follow Like Daughter. Issue eight's been done for a while, but since we've had so much in the, the docket, um, it's just a fine time to uh, host it. So it's safe to say you're a little busy. Um, a little, only a little. Just, just a tiny bit. <laughs> Congratulations on the successful Kickstarter as well, too. Thank you. Uh, I was trying to figure out how to put that into the actual questions and show itself, but it's successful. That's all that really matters here. Over 500 backers is incredible. That's, that's amazing to see. How was the, the start of the campaign to its current end result? How did that go for you? Well, we're, we're kind of a well-oiled machine at this point. We've done a lot of Kickstarters. Our by visibility got over 1,300 backers. So that definitely helps a lot. When we have a new campaign, uh, a lot of those backers can back our current campaign. And like I said, we've, we've kind of become a well-oiled machine. We do these a lot. At this point, this year, we're almost doing them monthly, uh, having Kickstarters, just because of how many projects we have. The beginning of it, for that project, it was about you know, putting the pre-launch page out there for about a week or so, hitting up our mailing list and, you know, our previous Kickstarters and saying, hey, we're going to go live at this date, updating our webtoon uh, and letting people know about the Kickstarter there. It's kind of going through the motions at this point, you know, uh, I think on social media, it's really about showcasing something different, not just keep shouting out that you're alive. Uh, and that's something I've learned throughout the years uh, is like, okay, talk about something interesting. Uh, don't just talk about like, oh, go check out my Kickstarter. We'll talk about the story or like, if you were going to like a tweet on Twitter, what would it be about? Would it be like, go check out my Kickstarter? Probably not, unless it's like just launched or something, unless it's like news. Um, but if you're doing that for the 15th day on a row, then it's like, okay, um, I know that your Kickstarter is live. Uh, tell me something else. And you could say like, oh, maybe it didn't hit everybody, but you're going to hit more people by just being a little more original. Anyways, as a tangent, <laughs> as you said, I can have. So there you go. Tangents are free reign here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I'll, I'll, I'll go on all the tangents. We had a good beginning. And this campaign, again, just because of scheduling, we wanted to make this a 30 day campaign to fit this secret project we have. And then by visibility, we're going to have in June. Um, we wanted to do the secret project. We had to have this one be shorter. But we cut out a whole week and, and we still did uh, very well. We had a smooth, a pretty smooth Kickstarter overall. As a writer, how did you start as a, as a comic writer, as a writer in general? Yeah, uh, that's such an interesting question. So I've been doing this for about five years, uh, mm. probably a little bit more. Um, I've been reviewing comics for about 10 so when I was in high school, I made a YouTube channel, started doing comic reviews. I still, I still do comic reviews. Uh, and then I started doing journalism for like IGN and 
DC Comics and Newsarama. I became a comic journalist uh, through the reviews. And then I realized I still do journalism here and there, but, uh, and I still do my YouTube channel. My passion lied in creating comics. So that's something I really wanted to do. And in college, I had this screenplay I wrote called Life All I Daughter. And I was like, oh, why not make this comic? And that kind of just started it all. How my career has advanced in a lot of ways is by being better at Kickstarter, but then also just creating things to put in different outlets like Slice of Life. Something we're really proud of is to kind of mix the traditional comics with the popularity of Webtoon. That's something that we've really enjoyed. I have a business partner that's been nice too for the past year or so we've been working together and we've been friends for a very long time so it's cool that we actually uh get to write comics together too we uh work our slice life together that's why i'm the co-creator of it but then we have our individual projects so he is haunting and i have i call a daughter and the dancer so we we try to do individual stuff and then also come together and, and do a lot of projects as well uh, that's amazing. It's it's great to see that, especially with the YouTube channel and especially with the uh, journalism and all of that other stuff as well, too. It works out to be, you're still passionate about, well, being a geek <laughs> for mm -hmm. one. And also you're passionate about, uh, you know, showcasing, you know, comics that people haven't seen yet or before or an interesting take on, on whatever you get to review as well, too. Plus creating your own work is even, even more satisfying, I think. Oh, yeah, for sure. I love both elements. I enjoy creating, obviously, and seeing, I mean, on Webtoon, it's really amazing to see comments every week to literally get feedback every single week about your project in real time. But then uh, from like the reviewing perspective or just the journalism, uh, journalism perspective, writing an article about something I care about or talking to a person I care about, talking about their work and why you should read their work has always been uh, interesting to me and something I enjoy doing. So then as a, as a writer and as a creative person that you are specifically, you know, what is the hardest part about writing? Is it the beginning, the middle, or the end when you start a story? Ooh, I'd say all of it. <laughs> <laughs> um, the end is great because it's like, all right, I'm, I'm done. So I'm getting close to being done. So I don't think the end is too hard. I would say starting and trying to figure out what your ideas are definitely is tough, especially if you're creating a new world. If like I'm writing a next chapter of Slice of Life, that, those are probably the easiest ones just because it's these characters that we've written so many pages of. And because I, I have a co-writer, so I'm stuck somewhere. He could be like, oh, how about this and vice versa. And that's helpful. But when you're creating a new world and a new idea, it takes time to, to do that. In the middle, it depends on your flow, right? If you know what you're doing and you're like, oh, this is, you know, this, this and that. And some projects happen like that. You're like, oh, I finished. I was so quick. And then there are some projects you'll sit on for two years because you're like, I don't know where this is going. So uh, I think it depends on the project, really. And then it, it depends on the muse uh, and the time period. I, I think um, world building is, is fascinating as well as namology. And this is kind of a two-parter. It's actually two separate questions. But mm -hmm. looking at the world, that, worlds, I should say, not world, <laughs> worlds that you've built specifically for your, your comics. And we'll start with Slice of Life and we'll, we'll go through... Um, the others as well too how did the world come about for slice of life so for slice of life me and my business partner phil we wrote a crossover with his book haunting and my book life Folly daughter and we just did it because like you know we want to have fun and we hadn't written anything together but we'd be sharing projects and like scripts to each other like oh why haven't we written anything together so we did the crossover and it was one of the easiest projects to write. And we're like, oh, that was like super easy. Sometimes it doesn't always come like that when we're working separately. So we're like, oh, it'd be kind of cool if we had an ongoing book that we could work on. And that was the birth of Slice of Life because we were both very interested in Webtoon and trying to mix traditional comics of Kickstarter, we'll say, with the Webtoon audience and, and vice versa. We're both queer, so we wanted to um, write a queer story, and we knew it was popular on Webtoons. And then he had the idea of an anime character coming to life. He's had it in his back pocket for a while, and he's like, oh, I think this could be kind of cool to bring to life. And then the other elements, we worked together. I was like, I've always enjoyed like high school stories, so I was like, oh, this could be really fun to make them in high school. And then I'm a twin myself, so I was like, oh, it'd be kind of cool to have the person who brings this girl to life as like this super fan. So we have a commentary about fandom. The sister, who doesn't really care about the show as much, who's this cheerleader, actually fall in love with those girls. It's about breaking down genre slice of life, which is stories about everyday life. It, it really is just like, oh, let's talk about life. What What is life and how do we live it? So we, we really try to reverse engineer 
what the slice of life genre is. So yeah, that's kind of where we went with it. And then the world definitely expanded even more as we got to know these characters and be, they became more layered as we created the world. So then what about like father, like daughter? Because I do want to touch on all of your works mm-hmm. while, while we're doing this here. Yeah. So like father, daughter, again, it was the first book I ever wrote for a comic. I've been reading comics all my life. Um, I started with Silver Age books with my what my dad would used to read to me. And then in like second grade, I really like started liking Spider-Man and the X-Men. So I became a big Marvel fan. So like, and obviously over the years as a critic and just a reader, I read a lot of stuff. Like I read Marvel, I read DC, I read Indies. I just, I really just like reading comics and I'm very familiar with them. So I really wanted to break down the tropes of comics, uh, everything that we enjoy about superheroes. And I wanted the comic to be about what if the supporting character, uh, the daughter character of a superhero who never really gets panel time is actually the main character Mm. of this comic because it's about her dad left her to become a full-time superhero. So 10 years later, uh, she gets superpowers and she's like, ooh, what do I do with this? Um, you know, the, the very powers that made my dad leave, uh, I now have. So just want to become like a villain. Spoiler alert, she doesn't. She's a hero. She doesn't want to do that either. So what, what do you do with that? So it's really putting those tropes on its head. I mean, I just created the world of like, how about if Superman left? his daughter one of my favorite comics of all time is spider girl which has to do with the daughter of spider-man so i was like i I really took the love of that comic and used that as inspiration for this world and then they call her dancer the dancer uh was my second project and i also wrote that in college with this one i went to a liberal arts college i saw a lot of dancers a lot so visually that's kind of how i got the visuals but also growing up i did martial arts and i did dance i always thought about how they were very similar if you look at it martial arts could be choreography especially if you look at it in film and then dance could be violent to the body of a dancer you know you could hurt your body and no it's a lot harder than what people think and you have to be very strong to be a dancer as well you have to build a lot of muscles those elements like physically were very interesting to me and it's about uh this young woman who witnessed her parents dying when she was little so it's pretty much batman but it's her dealing with her trauma because that's what the book's about you have this like very physical story which is you know she's a dancer and martial art and assassin we get to see that we actually instead just dive into the mental anguish of her losing her parents. And that's that's the full story is like, how do you deal with PTSD? The art is beautiful on every single one of these that I've, I've gotten to see as well, too. I think it's amazing that you're able to go between different genres and, and different characters and, and create a, a wonderful world, wonderful worlds, I should say, regarding all of these as well, too. But as a, as a writer, uh, what is your creative kryptonite? Ooh, um... I would say (laughs) sci-fi. I don't really like sci-fi and I don't really like fantasy. So when I hear a lot of like, about this world did this and this world did that. And I'm like, I'm like, I don't care. (laughs) I'm more of a character writer. So when I'm just hearing like, and there was a war 10,000 years ago, I'm like, cool. But I don't care about the war. You could talk about it for 30 minutes. It's not too much for me so yeah that would definitely be my writing kryptonite i'm not saying i wouldn't write fantasy but if i wrote fantasy it probably wouldn't have to do with the elements of fantasy and same thing for sci-fi if i'm writing about sci-fi it's probably not because of the mythology stuff that you really enjoy it's probably gonna tackle it from a different angle things are very very genre heavy and very like a little bit too world building is Mm. not my not my thing so not not a George R. R. Martin style where it lays out everything or the Hobbit where Tolkien exactly. just like explaining every single detail of the hair that moved in the wind. So Exactly. <laughs> I'm actually not even a Lord of the Rings fan because of that. I'm like, yeah. oh, I could tell it's not my thing. And I, I think I watched I read The Hobbit in high school and I'm like, yeah, it was fine. And then Star Wars is like, oh, yeah, the thing I like about Star Wars is like the family dynamic. I enjoy mm-hmm. like the characters and then I do see a lot of other people are like, but this, this, and that, and that, and that's, it's like, I think that's what's so great about Star Wars, that you can like two different sides of it. And also anything that's like very science-y explaining. So like a franchise I tend not to like as much as Star Trek, even though, again, totally see why people like it and respect the show and respect mm-hmm. the franchise, but I can never get into it because it's just so more science-based. Are there some tropes that you actively avoid or, or or do you see any tropes recently that have been overused in terms of writing? Maybe not just for comics, but mm. for mass media? 
I would say it's not something I avoid, but something I noticed that's been a trend. Uh, and someone even mentioned this. Because obviously, Doctor Strange came out. Mm-hmm. We have everything everywhere, whatever the last part of that title is. And then we just had Spider Man. So, like, with all these multiverse movies, which is super interesting. I'm not saying that's a bad thing. I just think it's very interesting that, like, the mainstream audience is like cool with multiple worlds now. Yeah. I don't think you could have done that before the MCU. So by far, I don't think you could have done that before the MCU. So, as a comic reader, like, that's just always something I knew of. And, like, you know, it was just always part of storytelling. Like, I remember I would sometimes try to explain, like, the, the CW shows to, like, my parents or whatever. Mm-hmm. And I'd be like, oh, yeah, that person's from another universe. You're like, what? <laughs> I was like, yeah, it's from, they're from another universe. And for me, it's like, yeah, no, I totally get that type of storytelling. But now it's, like, going into the mainstream, which I find super interesting. And a trope that I try not to do, oh, God, I hate when characters keep secrets for too long. I don't like when it's like two years and this person still doesn't know. That's probably the trope I, the opposite of avoiding. I literally just like, oh, first day, like the first moment they're going to tell their secret. Now I'm not saying like, I, if you watch like the Flash television show, there's mm-hmm. this joke where it's like, oh, he always tells everybody a secret identity. I don't think you should do that, but I think the in important characters, like the friend or the love interest, I like them to know early on. That way it's like, I don't need that unnecessary drama. Like, I think it's more interesting when they know. Like Superman could have avoided a whole bunch of issues if he just would have said to Lois Lane, hey, yeah, I'm Superman, by the way. It's all, it's cool, you know. Exactly. There there would have been a lot less decades of story where she didn't know. <laughs> but I find her story is more interesting now than when she didn't true. know. That is true. Yeah. They, they've done a really good job with the varying series as well, too. Um, especially more, more recently with... Um, Superman and Lois. Thank you. Yeah, I didn't. There I didn't want to like do the '90s version. Of yeah, the, the Lois. Yeah. yeah, Lois and Clark are, still reminds me of Lewis and Clark, but that's beside the point. <laughs> What's your most recent literary pilgrimage that took you somewhere you didn't realize? Ooh, um, man, that's. I read a lot of like trashy. Not trashy. I don't want to use the word trashy. <laughs> I love read like romance. I, I enjoy like queer romance novels. Mm-hmm. Like when I am not working and I want to escape in media, I like to read things that have nothing to do with my job. Even though I guess now it kind of does have to do with my job. But slice of life just feels like such a different beast. I don't mind it as much. But that's like what brought it on Spice Life because I used to just really enjoy reading queer stories because I wasn't writing really any, any queer stories. So I was like, oh, this is kind of outlet of like I'll watch like reality shows or something like that or like youtube channels just because it's like something that has nothing to do with my work Mm -hmm. because if i'm watching doctor strange like yeah maybe i'll enjoy it if i'm watching spider-man i think that's a better example if i'm watching the new spider-man movie i'm like yeah hell yeah i'm enjoying it as a fan but also like i'm kind of there for work as well like i know i might have to write an article or i have to share it on social media like i'm there for that it's a little hard to escape with other media (laughs) because of that i've enjoyed a couple of authors I used to never be a no- like a novel reader, like a prose reader. So it's been fun over the past couple of years to kind of jump a little bit more into prose and, and read that and read something like fun. There's some really great romance stories out there. And that's why I want to re- retract the word trashy. It's just what you think of when you're like, oh, romance novels. But they're not. They're very good. And I've, I've enjoyed a lot of stories of that. I've been reading like the Dave Grohl book that he wrote. So I've been also just exploring other prose and I just like learning a lot of times about like people's lives that I admire. So I'm a big Foo Fighters fan, so I like that. Lennon Doyle, I think, is a great uh, writer, and she has a lot of interesting things to say as a as a person. So yeah, those are things that kind of inspire me, but also work as escapism. I enjoy like YouTube channels, having a good laugh. I enjoy food videos. Like I enjoy when people critique food like critique oh, okay. going to applebee's um, i tell people they're like what it's just like they're called mukbang it's a thing i enjoy that because it says nothing to do my with my work but i love like just criticism of food like i enjoy seeing people be like i like this because of this or i didn't like this because of that that's something i enjoy the british bake-off or anything like that or? exactly yeah, yeah 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 except they're not cooking the food they're just <laughs> eating it <laughs> but it's kind of like that when the judges talk about the food and they're like oh it was good because of this it's like let's pretend that those people only critique the food and they didn't cook it that's that's that i love like hell's kitchen and stuff like that so yeah. what's the most misunderstood aspect about being a, a queer writer oh um i'll answer just the writer part and then okay, i'll answer sorry. the second part no 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 only because like when you're saying that 
I was like, oh, I get this a lot of cons. And then I think it means, yeah, interestingly, I would love to answer the queer one too. Okay. Um, but yeah, with the writer one, only because something came to my mind when you said that was that people think it's really easy. <laughs> people come up and be like, yeah, like I could make a comic, right? Like, and I was like, he's like, oh, how, can I, like, I want to become a writer. And I'm like, that's awesome. I would love to hear like, oh, have you started writing? I'm like, no, how do I make a comic though? It's like, well, you start writing. So I don't want to do that. I'm like, hmm. I think you gotta like write it <laughs> uh and they're like i want to make a comic so that's that's fun so that's a little sidetrack but yeah queer writer what people misunderstand uh, i would say just writing queer characters people think it's just about them being gay <laughs> it's just like uh yeah no that's part of their story and i think that's important and i think being queer informs their lives like you know, obviously it's a part of their characters just as me being queer informs my life, but I'm not defined by just my queerness. I think it's a big part of it, which is why I make queer comics and I like queer stories and I could make authentic queer stories, but like Slice of Life, it's not just about them being gay. It's about them living life, but then also it is about them being gay too. Like one of the main characters, she uh, is not dealing with coming out very well. Cheerleader, she uh, has a lot of internalized hom homophobia towards herself. We kind of delve into why. Well, I can't spoil it. I will tease that it's not for a reason you think it is. So I find that very fascinating. But really, it's just about living life, that book. So it's not just about them being queer, but that's a big part of it. So I think that's the biggest misconception where people are like, well, all they're doing is being gay. I'm like, well, yeah, they're gay or they're queer, but that doesn't mean that's all they're doing. That's not their full story. But also, you got to include that they're queer. There's a balancing act. <laughs> So then in your opinion, what is the most important quality of a writer in comics today? And how does that translate to what you've written? That's a good question. I would say it's not even the writing aspect. I like obviously writing is important, mm -hmm. uh, but it, the being able to do the balancing act, it's like knowing how to be an editor of yourself, uh, obviously even get an editor, but like knowing how to do that knowing how to promote yourself, knowing about Kickstarter, knowing the landscape of like business. Uh, so you have to be a business person. You have to be, a, you know, a social media guru. You have to be a writer all at once. So I think that's like the biggest challenge. And the thing you have to know as a writer is to do all those things or else um, you could be writing the next Lord of the Rings, but no one's seen it or you don't know how to promote it. No one, no one would have read it. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Ooh, oh my God. That's a really good question. Let's say when I, this is weird. This is just the first thing that comes to mind. But when uh, Heroes, the TV show was starting to become popular, I remember like a, a big reason why that became popular was because of that logo, like the, the, um the, the little log line of like oh save the cheerleader save the world like, that was a big reason why that show was popular was just because of that so i mean obviously there's other elements but like just because you had this really fun little saying and i love the show too so yeah. you know season one was great <laughs> yeah. the rests the season two was okay three just went off the rails but yeah yeah and then four was even worse <laughs> yeah. what was the hardest scene for you to write for say slice of life Ooh. The second episode of the of the comic, because the first episode Phil got to write and it was just setting up what the anime was. So it, it was just like, all right, she's an anime character. And we reveal that in, in the show that she died. And you're like, what? And that's like the whole thing. I'm like, oh, this is like a bad show. This is like a horrible show. And they just ended it on the worst cliffhanger ever. So everyone's shocked like raven who's the super fan is like oh my god that's the worst it, for different reasons she hated it and then lucy's like why did they kill her off she should have like lived her life because the whole entire show was her um wanting revenge for her boyfriend's death uh that was the whole story and then it's like oh you know she could have found love somewhere else like there, there's a more to her journey than just revenge which is why her anime show was called lady vengeance in the end of that first episode she comes to life so she just died and she's coming into this new world. So I would say, A, you had to like get the voices of all three characters. This is the first time our romance are meeting each other. You're also dealing with the, the existential crisis of getting into the real world while also just dealing with, I just died. So that was definitely the hardest chapter I had to write. I had to write it a couple of times and to really kind of get it to a place that we both really liked. 
I never had to go through so many drafts for Slice of Life. I think we went through like six, which is like not a horrible amount for comics. Now it's so easy to us. Like we'll write one draft and maybe there'll be like here and there some notes. Like obviously we'll beat sheet and all that in that line. It's just so easy for us to write these days. It's not hard to get a draft out, but that that was hard. It was a, it was a hard one. What was the first comic that made you cry? Ooh. I don't cry very often, but I think the one that made me emotional Mm -hmm. from what I can remember, uh, which wasn't even that long ago, was probably when Flash Thompson died Mm. in Spider-Man. Because I remember, you know, the Dan Slott run lasted so long. But then also he was a character. And as we see, he's not really back, kind of. I mean, he's been back a little bit, but it's been years. And he, you know, he could be a character that wasn't going to come back anytime soon. So, I was, and I thought just the way it was written was really good. I didn't cry. I don't think I've ever cried at a comic book, but I, I got emotional with that book. And that's one I remember being emotional about. Do you believe in writer's block? Not, not have you had writer's block, because I think we all have, but do you believe in it? Yeah, definitely. I think the reason it's there, I know people will say it's like, oh, maybe something in the story is not working which I think is true. Um, but also it could just be your mind frame. I think sometimes you got to step away from a project if you have writer's block and write something else. Because a lot of times it's just more of like, even procrastination, sometimes like you just don't want to write in the moment. And that's okay. But sometimes and when it's your job, you have to. Um, so you have to really just force yourself to write a sentence or two and then if that helps. It's, uh, it's like, all right, write something that you know you might not even use, but it's just something to write. Yeah, definitely believe that. It exists for sure. The why is the questionable part. (laughs) I think that's something that we all have to deal with at at some point. Uh, Why are we doing this? Why can't we do this? (laughs) (laughs) Why isn't my coffee filled up when I'm trying to write? You know. Oh yeah. The the life 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 altering questions. I think. (laughs) (laughs) The existential questions. Yes. How many unfinished books or scripts do you have? Oh man. Uh, not too many. I think I, I am definitely one that is here to finish things. I have a lot of things that, uh, so I am, uh, I went to school for TV writing. So there's a lot of things I had to do for just portfolio reasons. I have a couple of stories that are just TV pilots and I like them. And I think one day I would really, really like to go back, like make them comics. And I, I call those unfinished because it's like, oh, this is a really cool kernel of an idea. I would say there's two things that aren't finished. Three things. One that we are going to finish and literally just haven't had time to go back to, but that is the next project we're going to do. There's another project is going to be started again too soon as well. So yeah, no, there's a good amount. There's a, there's enough, but I, I won't call them abandoned. I think there's only been one story that's abandoned right now. There are actual plans to get them done. Uh, and it makes sense for why they're not finished right now, for the most part. <laughs> so then if you could turn Slice of Life into a live action version of, of your from your comic to a live action show, who would you have as the cast of characters for the main Ooh, characters? That's a really good question. It's hard because they're all teenagers and I don't know if I know enough <laughs> teen uh It'd be cool. I think Jojo Siwa would be interesting for Lucy. Uh, she's blonde and she's like a gay icon. I really like Jojo. So Jojo would be interesting for Lucy. Yuriko. I know that all the boys you love actress is cool. She's an interesting actress. I think her name is Laura something. The actress from Everything Everywhere uh, was really good too. The um, daughter. I think she'd be interesting. Yeah, those are my quick ones for that. I'm never good at the casting ones, especially now because, like, I'm 27. I still enjoy, you know, there's good teen shows here and there, but it's a little harder. So I'm sure, like, my perception of, like, a cool teen actress or someone to play a teen actress is probably not the actor teens would actually want to see. <laughs> That's what casting directors are for, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly, right? Before I do that, though, is there anything I haven't touched upon? And we will get into the where can we find you, how can we support you bit uh, as well towards the end of the interview uh, that you'd like to showcase those that are watching and listening to this interview. No, you hit everything. I, I, Yeah, you did a great job at it. I will say most interviews I go on, they usually only touch on one thing. It's like, oh, this is the Kickstarter you're doing. So thank you for touching on it all. Well, I wouldn't be doing this for 14 years if I didn't multiple, <laughs> do everything that someone has created. So, uh, which is why I did your title image the way I did, because there was just so much that different variety of genres that, you know, it was perfect for your background. At what point are we good enough? 
Ooh. I think when you're comfortable, I'll just say this as a writer. I mean, I think as a person, you're never going to feel good enough. <laughs> um, or at least that's just my perspective of life. I feel like even if you're in your happiest time, you're never going to feel like you're in your happiest time because you'll look back and you'll be like, that was great. But in the moment, you're going to be like, I always want more. I and mean, as a writer, at least for me, when I feel satisfied is like when I really break a really cool story and, and I could read it and be like, oh, I like that. That happens. I know for some people, they read their stuff and they just don't like it at all. I like the work I write. There are times that maybe I don't find a draft perfect, but maybe when I step away for a couple of weeks and I go back, I'd be like, oh no, that was a lot better than I expected, you know, than when I went back um, and read it. I think it's when you can read something and be like, oh, I like this and I can see why people like this. I'm not saying it's going to be perfect. So I don't think you're ever going to think your work's perfect, but you enjoy what you wrote. I think that's what's important. How do you think the birth of creativity was formed? Ooh, the birth of creativity. I mean, people would say the Renaissance, right? I think it, oh, wow. I honestly think it's always been there. I think since the dawn of time, I think maybe it just wasn't on record of people being creative, but I think it was just always there. I think in little ways, everyone, unless everyone's doing the same thing, they're being creative. That's a good question. <laughs> I, I love uh, like, philosophy so i think this is uh i like this <laughs> all right what is something you think every person should experience once in their lifetime happiness hmm. yeah i think happiness i think when you you truly are in the moment and you're just like you're just like man nothing could bring me down i really think it's just like either if that's a person that's around you or you just it, you know, you just wrote the best script in your life. Whatever that means, happiness means to you. Because I think happiness means something different to everybody. So I think in that moment, if you feel happy, and that doesn't mean like you might feel sad five minutes later, but you feel happy in that one moment. Um, I think everyone should experience that or experience many moments of happiness. And I hope that most people have. Everyone always asks, what's the wisest thing someone's ever said to you? Or what's the BS thing someone's ever said to you? But what is the second wisest thing someone has Ooh. ever said to you second wisest thing someone has ever told me oh man now that you're on the spot you want to say something good i don't know honestly i think it's just your first draft is not your last draft i think that and even if it's in your head it doesn't mean that it's final like you could change whatever you want until it's published i'm sure there's something else but you said second so that that works <laughs> <laughs> what is one mistake you will never do again <laughs> What's well, one mistake I would never do again? There's so many things. <laughs> <laughs> I feel that kind of revert the question a little bit and say that I'm glad for all the mistakes I made. Let's say like for Kickstarter, right? When I did my first Kickstarter for my account, I think my biggest mistake was my thumbnail. I think there's a lot of elements. Uh, you know, I could have had cooler variant covers or I could have done this, this and that. Um, my prices could have been higher, my, whatever. Every single campaign I've done, I learned because I made a mistake, whatever that means. I did something that maybe I could have done better. That's something I'm super proud of because I think every Kickstarter, if you're not learning yeah. from them, I don't think there's a such thing as perfection. I don't think, I, I think you should always continue to try leveling up and try and do something different because you're just going to plateau if you're not doing something different. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who is that for you? I have somebody who's like a grandma figure, uh, mm -hmm. who's not like my blood relative, but she like helped raise me. So I'd say her, she went through a lot of stuff in her life. And I think she's an inspiration for that. Definitely uh, inspires me. But everyone, I think in my life does, but if I had to pick one person, she's someone who inspires me. From a professional standpoint, you are a journalist, you are a comic writer, you are a co-creator of many amazing, talented works that are listed in your lower third and you will create many more in the future as well too so professionally you're successful in that regard do you consider yourself personally successful Whew. what a great question i think some days i do i think some days i'm like man i think a year ago uh, my career was very different and a year before that my career was very different and i keep growing and i'm successful and i think there's a lot of people in from the outside looking in with find what i do very successful um, but then there's other days where I'm like, oh, I want more and I want to be more successful. So, uh, yes, I find myself successful, but that doesn't mean I don't want to be more successful.
The reverse of success is failure. How do you deal with your failures? Ooh, luckily I've never had a failed Kickstarter, so I don't know how I deal with that. But <laughs> uh, not making my goal meal whoa. But how do I deal with failure? Is I usually talk it out with somebody I care about for a good hour or so and just repeat it over and over again and be like, this is why this sucks. And then I kind of get over it. <laughs> um, I just like, I just need to talk it out for a little while and just be like, this, this sucks and this is the reason why. And then I'm able to kind of like, go to the next thing. So it's just kind of talking it out, honestly. The young generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic writer or a creative person or journalist or whatever they would like to be creatively. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? Ooh. Um, I think just always, I think every generation could just say, like, be yourself and do what you want. And then once you do, I think people are going to find that they love your work. Because if you love your work, someone's going to love your work. So I think the generation before me is doing what they want to do and being themselves. Then the generation after that and the generation after that should continue that as well. If you could have a comic book or film based off of your life, what would the title be? And what would the genre of your soundtrack be? Ooh, okay. Um, what would be the title of my life? Wow. I want to say Comic Uno because it's my YouTube channel name. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I would love to say that. Uh, so I guess I'll go with that. And then for the soundtrack of my life, I think it it would be very like indie pop. I would say like, you know, it's so funny. Um, I talked to some of my friends about like, because we all, you know, sometimes we like music. Some of my friends don't, but we were talking about, I, I have a very wide variety of music of what I like. But my friends said, uh, yeah, cat's music is very much if it was like a song in a movie. <laughs> so I guess just the music I listen to is the songs in a movie. So already uh, I could just use the songs I listen to to put into this movie. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, I think like slow pop, I enjoy pop. I like rock as well. So maybe, I would say maybe, you know what? It'd just be like a, it would not be a fun sound con soundtrack to listen to. Cause I think it'd be like so diverse. You'll have a musical song in one track and then you'll have like Remo in the next. But I think that's what I would want. Like I would want it to be so diverse that no one person will enjoy this whole track, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> They'll pick and choose their favorite songs from, from their soundtracks that they always do, you know? Exactly. Just play play on repeat just like when they had that one song from the matrix that no one never knows the title of but they know the baseline so you know <laughs> i agree uh, well i do hate to say this cat but that ends this particular episode of two geeks talking i want to thank you so much for coming on the show i greatly appreciate it of course thank you for having me this was a lot of fun and some really cool questions how can we support you and where can we find you online and of course we didn't even talk about your youtube channel which means that we have to get you back on in the future and we'll talk about YouTube channels too. Yeah, that'd be fun. Uh, yeah, you could, if you want to follow my YouTube channel, I do weekly comic book reviews on Comic Uno. You can follow me on Twitter at Comic Uno. And uh, the best way to support our work right now, obviously, always look at our Kickstarter. It's under my name, Cat Calamia. Um, but the Webtoon is posted weekly on on Webtoon for under Slice of Life GL. Search Slice of Life GL because there is a genre called Slice of Life. So makes it a little harder to find um but uh we we have that so please support it we have patreon there so if you want episodes in advance it's a great way to support or you can support the kickstarter get a physical book get a plush doll um and yeah we have a kickstarter coming up that's a secret of what it is uh, until monday so please follow me on twitter at comic you know that's the best place to find out what it's all about Awesome. Well, thank you so much again. I greatly appreciate it. And of course, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. You can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others on our website, tgtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. That's the word two, not the number two. And of course, on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com forward slash TGT Media. And it's a lot more updated than our website because I'm only one person doing all of this stuff. So go there first before you go to the website. <laughs> But as I say every week, everyone has a story to tell. It's up to me to help bring that out. Thanks for listening and watching on Two Geeks Talking.